Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. We're going to just chat for the first few minutes while people gather. Um, thanks especially to Dennis, um, who I see is on the call already, for um, referring us to uh, his friend Brian Ringley at Boston Dynamics, who then connected us with Noni. And um, then we connected also with Gabriel because he's on the design tech committee and he's working on a project with Boston Dynamics, as uh, you'll hear. And wanna encourage everybody to jump in, um, add comments or ask questions as we go. Um, we planned to have content for 30 minutes, although any of the presenters could talk for the whole time. Um, so that there's plenty of time allowed for everybody to participate. I'd be kind of interested um, if people would say something about where they're from or what their perspective is on the topic. Like, does anybody work for a construction company? What are, you doing these, what, are you, what are you doing these days, Mark? Sorry, guys. What's, I have to apologize. What's the topic again? <laughs> Construction technology. Oh, you, yeah, I'm going to introduce it when we start. So I did do it at the same time for everyone. Well, so we're, we're it's a small firm. Um, Aiden, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to ignore it. Um, yeah, so I moved from, from HOK to a very small um, design slash construction firm now. So there's just a handful of us. Uh, but your question is about the technology that we use? Just in yeah. general? I mean, especially because the topic is construction technology. The audience typically for these design tech meetups is more from the design side, from architecture yeah. firms. And so I was especially curious if there were participants on the call from construction firms. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I count. Um, I'm. <laughs> I'm. I, I'm still on the design side. So yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I can. I can uh, roll myself out. Mm -hmm. quite so, but I'd, I'd be really curious to hear uh, hear myself. So. Still, still nice to see uh, here where you're from or, or where you're where you are these days. I, I don't know if I actually really knew where you um uh, ended up after HOK. Okay. So that was uh, good to see. Yeah, yeah. I'm in uh, I'm in downtown Portland now. So uh, oh, you're in Portland. Oh wow. Um, yeah, to make the make the make the shift up. So okay. Uh, One of your neighbors is already on the call. Riley. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm in Old Town right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm over in, in the Pearl District. Uh, oh, wonderful! Right, right, right next there's, to the right next to the freeway. So. Yeah, there's some spooky blocks between us. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting so down here these days. Yeah. So I, for I came, everyone, I came in right at the very end of the uh, the very end of the, the riots, so timed it timed oh. it just perfectly. <laughs> Okay, well, we're almost at the end of the five minutes for people to gather. So I guess I'll just jump in now. Um, my name is Dave Alpert. And along with Dennis and Gabriel, um, I'm in the design tech committee of the AIA SF. Um, myself, I'm an architect by experience. And I currently lead a software company called Geopogo. And we've contributed to these meetups before on events that were around our topic. But tonight we have the topic of construction technology. And what, one of the things that we'll hear from the three co-presenters is that construction technology is very closely connected with robotics now, which makes a lot of sense because we're at that point away from the drawing boards and we're actually building something in the field so um, robotics makes a lot of sense. And you'll hear um, from Brian Ringley from Boston Dynamics, and then from Nodi Pittinger, um, who is the director of construction automation at Assembly OSM. 
And then finally from Gabriel Sorrento, who's the director at Vection Technologies. Um, and they'll each give their own perspective on the topic. And as I say, I really encourage you to jump in as we go along. And at the end, I'll give a little bit of a blurb about the meetup for October, which will be on October 20th uh, on the topic of generative design. Okay, so um, Brian, I realized I didn't give you much of an introduction, but um, Brian has had uh, a varied background. Um, before coming to Boston Dynamics, he was a construction automation research in commercial real estate. And now he manages autonomy product development for spots, dynamic sensing capabilities. And spot is a robot. You want to start, Brian? Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, I'm the construction technology manager at Boston Dynamics, uh, which is basically a product manager for the spot robot, uh, specifically for um, AEC applications. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen so I can show some slides. And my screen froze, so one second. There we go. I went like super full screen mode and it was like too much to handle. Go back. All right, so yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what it means to have uh, robots in construction and specifically what is this robot actually doing on construction sites? Who is it doing it for? Um, so you'll see that I'm focusing on the subtopic of dynamic job site sensing. So this is a sensing robot um, doing, doing different types of data capture on job sites. And let me minimize this video in case that's an artifact on the screen. All right, so um, we have three main robots right now that we're working on. We have a warehouse robot called Stretch that uses uh, special machine vision software to see boxes really well called PIC. And then we have an R&D robot called Atlas, which is a humanoid robot that does things like dancing and backflips and parkour, which is really to test the edge of robotic dynamics and balance and something we kind of refer to as athletic intelligence. And then we have a essentially a mobility platform that is primarily used for dynamic sensing in construction industrial environments called Spot, um, otherwise known as the robot dog, I believe as it's colloquially referred to. And Spot brings best in class agile mobile robotics to your site. So we say agile is a way of kind of distinguishing from typical AMRs or automated mobile robots or autonomous mobile robots. Um, that can struggle with uh, raised elements, obstacles, gaps, stairs, et cetera. So the advantage of having legs is that you can really get anywhere in a human purposed environment. That's really what Spot was designed to do. It has 360 degrees of perception with five cameras around its body that also enable uh, terrain recognition and obstacle avoidance. And then of course the dynamic stabilization that keeps it balanced at all times. Um, it provides automation in the data capture through a 90 minute battery life, but can also be self-charged through a dock. And then we have software for flexible autonomous mission planning. So you can send it out to capture data in your environment. And then lastly, we allow for a certain amount of customization. So it can carry up to 30 pounds of payloads because you do want to put sensors that matter to you in construction, typically things like 360 cameras and laser scanners. We have a spot SDK or software development kit to allow developers to build additional applications that connect with the robot or use robot data to do meaningful and valuable things downstream from the robot. And then we have an application ecosystem built off of that. Um, so, Sorry. yeah, do you have what a question? Do you mean, what do you mean by self-charging? You mean like it'll, when the battery is low, it'll go back to its charging station or what? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, there's a spot dock. Uh, that it uses to recharge um, that battery so that if you have if you have a robot that you want to schedule to start a mission later you want to keep it charged uh, you want to recharge it after it runs a long mission or between long missions to kind of extend where it can go 
that doc also actually serves as a good place to do the data upload as well because it does have a gigabit ethernet connection and the robot does also connect to data in addition to power when it docks and i think i have a picture of that in a second nice yeah um so the idea is that we make robots uh, easy to use for non-roboticists through good software. So it's about as easy to use, I would argue probably easier to use than flying a drone. Um, so we offer a tablet application that you can use to essentially pilot the robot around a site and record a robot route and record actions. So those actions can be things like take a scan here or take a photograph here and then you save that recording and then you can play that back autonomously. And the robot will exhibit things like obstacle avoidance if somebody leaves like a toolbox in the way or something on the site changes and can also recognize features in a way that as a construction site progresses, it still knows where it is, which can be you know confusing even for human workers. And I mentioned the ability to add payloads or sensors on top of the robot. You know, we've bootstrapped this a bit ourselves. We have a spot cam with an optional pan tilt zoom camera on there for inspection work. We have a spot arm for mobile manipulation. There's actually also a camera within that gripper to allow for computer vision driven um, manipulation actions and a spot core which is an onboard CPU that allows you to put custom software on top of the robot to connect third-party things. Uh, so then on the right showing um, an exercise we did very early on with Trimble, making sure that that X7 laser scanner or their X7 laser scanner rather could be mounted in basically like any configuration with a lot of our different default payloads that we offer. And just to touch again on the software development kit, which is how people build uh, software, custom software to control Spot. Um, most people are trying to take Spot data and make sure that that comes into their construction management software seamlessly, or they're trying to make it so that a robot can control a device. So the robot's controlling the laser scanner and triggering scans autonomously, for example. Uh, some people add their own full autonomy stack on top of the robot, so like NASA's JPL team has added all sorts of like hardware and their own, uh, you know, autonomy and slam systems on top of the robot and are really just using the base mobility of the robot and, and customizing everything else themselves. And, and it was designed to allow for that. Um, so when we look at uh, the construction industry, uh, you know, I could put any number of uh, horrifying statistics up here, but the one I tend to focus on is that, you know, nearly every construction project runs over schedule and therefore over budget. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but I think the central point that we're focusing on is it is, it is surprisingly hard to know what's going on on your job site at any given moment. And the less you know at any given moment, the more things can kind of add up and create additional problems and delays. Um, as you know, like if somebody comes to site and the site's not properly staged for their trade work, it's not like they just come back the next day. That can all of a sudden be like a two or three week shift. So we're really looking to provide that level of visibility and that level of visibility requires a lot of data and well-structured data. So in my prior job at WeWork as a construction researcher, we asked the job site supers what they wanted us to try to automate with robots. This was before I even used spots, thinking about how to bring robots on the job site to do meaningful things. And a lot of them pointed to this idea of the daily job site walk and data capture. And it was already kind of proven by the fact that people were moving around the site that this was a dynamic sensing challenge. Um, there wasn't really a cost effective uh, or reasonable way to instrument a changing job site with things like cameras or laser scanners. It just made more sense to use humans to move those things through the space, but humans aren't particularly good at it in terms of repeating the same location day after day after day. And they don't really want to do it. It's, it's dull work and they have a lot of other priorities uh, within the day. So they're often saving that to the very end of the day and, you know, not getting home to their families because they had to fuss around with getting job site photos and uploading those to the cloud. And I tried a lot of other robots too. The, what brought me to Spot was that I could not find an effective um, locomotion or locomotion type uh, for robots in job sites. So interior drones, drones are great for exterior applications, but interior applications had a lot of limitations and wheeled and tracked robots just could not 
could not really get through a flat floor with obstacles and gaps and, and raised edges, let alone, uh, you know, up and down stairs, which was also required. So that's what led me to spot and legs. Um, and it turned out that was hugely valuable. And in fact, the only way I could really get a sensor around a space autonomously. Um, so there are a number of different applications we've looked at, but I really like to hone in on the two that have really been proven by our customers. The first is site progress monitoring. This is typically done through 360 image capture, some kind of repeatable site walk day after day. On the right, you're actually seeing an integration by Hollow Builder. Um, called SpotWalk that was built on top of their job walk application that allows you to pin 360 photos to a floor plan and you do that day after day after day. And then that gives you kind of a four dimensional timeline of each location so you can compare and contrast the same location. Um, so there's the application that was just driven by a phone and they were able to control spot with that and get the data from spot and a similar application that was offered by drone deploy last year as a proof of concept, which was they had launched a 360 walkthrough feature to allow interior ground-based capture in addition to the capture they had already been doing with drones. They did that in partnership with Brassfield and Gorey. Um, and they actually acquired a New Zealand uh, autonomy company called Rokos and are now building like a full-on solution for ground robots in addition to drone robots. So they announced that today, I believe. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, the other one that we focus on is digital twins, the idea of getting laser scans and three-dimensional information, um, and ideally using that to uh, feed in on a kind of like regular cycle or schedule so that you're using that to, again, track progress and drive an understanding of the site. You're not just doing it for due diligence or for as-built documentation, and that also requires some additional downstream software uh, like, you know, Trimble analysis tools in FieldLink or Cloud Engine or even if you wanna bring that information into a centralized BIM uh, platform like Revit or Navis works using something like Avere that can match uh, point cloud features to BIM elements. So this all started quite a while ago and I think right before the pandemic uh, with Foster and Partners I think in like February, 2020 where they were using it on a job site. And it was just the notion of we need to maintain design intent. Therefore, we need to be able to track this stuff and scan day after day after day and compare that to the design data, which is a you know fairly simple concept. And then it was around the same time working with Swinnerton, a general contractor out of the Bay Area, that we started to understand the use of the VR, which is to say, yes, it's important to get the scans and compare them to the model, but the the art of comparing them to the model is highly manual. So don't just think about the capture, think about how the data gets to the platform and how you compare that to the model and that's where Avir comes in for the kind of process automation of the comparison between point cloud features and model elements. So I typically break the entire end-to-end -end solution down into five steps. It can be a little bit more nuanced than this, but these are the five major steps required to get the value, which is people are trying to monitor job sites using reality capture data in order to take some kind of value add action. And we very much see ourselves responsible for the first three steps, uh, the software to plan the route, to perform the autonomous capture, to transfer the data to you know, the cloud typically. Um, and then we share the third step and then the latter two steps are really with our partners. So on the left, you're seeing some shots from Trimble FieldLink and Trimble Cloud Engine for analyzing point clouds that are captured by Spot. So sharing in the data transfer step, but then really taking, taking on the responsibility for the analysis and then providing the insight and reporting for the action. And as we kind of move from applications to full end-to-end -end solutions or whole product solutions in the construction space, we have really leaned on that strategic alliance with Trimble to do that. So that's being released roughly at the end of the month in terms of the official release. We have some early adopters using it now Spot is completely controlled through the Trimble FieldLink interface, which also controls field devices like the X7 total stations and GNSS receivers. And then it also handles the data to the Cloud Engine platform where it can run analysis. And in closing, I also wanted to mention that Spot 3.0 was launched today. Uh, really excited about this. We've added a lot of flexibility to um, our autonomous missions, you can schedule them ahead of time. So you can just go home and let the robot do its work. Uh, you can set that to be unsupervised so that it doesn't require a connection to a controller or to a network because a lot of job sites suffer from 
an inability to connect to a network uh, dependably. Uh, you can edit missions, so you can remove actions that were previously recorded and kind of shortcut them if you know ahead of time that there are inaccessible areas on site. And conversely, you can add new actions and mission segments as new areas of your site become accessible. Um, and there's some dynamic rerouting and path planning. So uh, it is inevitable that one of your recorded routes will be blocked. Somebody will leave something in the way and the robot won't be able to pass through physically. So you can record as many alternative routes as you'd like within the map and the robot will basically just do what it takes to navigate within the areas you've allowed it to navigate to hit all of your data capture points. So it's not necessarily following a particular path. It's just following all possible paths that you've recorded in your map in order to complete the full data capture set. And then we've also added some computer vision integration as well. So on the right, um, we've got some kind of scene based correction that says, hey, if you're trying to look at and zoom in on a particular object, um, something like a pan tilt zoom camera can adjust to that based on the scene um, to get that exact gauge reading or get, you know, fire extinguisher label photo uh, accurate every single time. And you can actually also be running a computer vision model on that at the same time. So instead of just saying, here's a bunch of images and image metadata, you can also answer questions about the image. Is the gauge within an acceptable threshold? Um, do I have the fire extinguisher count I want? Things like that. So uh, I think I'm a little bit over time, so I'll go ahead and end it with that. You're muted, Dave. Um, I have a question though for, for Brian. Um, how much, maybe this isn't a fair question, but like probably varies based on the design, but how much like ground or, or area could a single robot cover, or maybe a better question, like how many, uh, I guess, like points could a single robot scan? There's no limit in the software. So when you have an enterprise robot and a dock, there is no limit in the software to the size of the map you can create. So the coverage really has to do with the speed of the robot and how if it has to stop for a data capture, like a scan takes more time than a photo or the robot never stops because you're just taking like 360 video, which is like a continuous sensor. Um, so I don't have like a hard and fast rule. I think now that we have like unlimited map size and action count and the dock, the next step after this will probably be adding additional docks or fleet management. You have multiple robots and you're managing those. And that's, that's largely managed through another piece of software we have called Scout. Um, but you know we're starting to deploy these things on really large large sites like uh, solar farms and uh, data centers, and we're definitely you know we're definitely coming up against some like limitations of like what a single robot and the range of a single dock can do. But there is there is no limit you know in the software and in the robots capability. So so we can continue to think about how to extend that with fleets of robots or additional docks. Yeah. So that's interesting. It doesn't necessarily have to stop, I guess, depending on what you're, you're recording. That's, that's kind of nice. I guess it could save a lot of time. Um, yeah. Depends on the sensor type. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, but so th I guess maybe as a, as a concrete example, like, like one of the Swinerton projects or, or the other projects you mentioned, like, did they just use a single robot for those projects or, or how many did they use? Yeah. Most people in construction are focused on operationalizing a single robot and a single dock. You know, that's really the stage they're at. Um, I think the robot has graduated out of a lot of like central VDC groups and is starting to go on to specific projects, like specific sites with project teams. And they're really looking at, you know, what can I do over three to six months using one robot and one dock and running a mission basically every day. And that's really the phase we're at now. We have a few customers kind of more in the industrial and utility space that are really starting to think more about fleet management. And they're going to be doing that with our Scout software um, or with some of the other fleet management software frameworks kind of out in the ecosystem. Super. Um, someone in the audience, raise their hand. Mike. Perfect, thank you, Dave. Um, I was curious, I had two questions. Um, the first one in designing construction, what do you see as, um, I guess the most attractive use case um, for contractors on site. And then the second question is, what happens when the site is undesirable for the robot? Um, it's muddy, it's snowy, um, or let's say those harsh weather environments. 
um, what occurs then? Yeah. Um, so the use cases, I'm super focused right now. And we kind of had a period of use case exploration and now I'm a little allergic to that <laughs> at this point. Like we've really proven that the digital twin with the autonomous laser scanning and the continuous site monitoring with the 360 imagery and photography or imagery and videography. Um, those are really the ones that are showing value and that customers are using to kind of solve problems. So for me, it's about making sure that we filled in all the gaps to provide like the whole product solution for each of those use cases. And part of why I talked a little bit about like partnerships with downstream analysis software, which is necessary because you don't really care that there's a robot on site. That's cool. What you care about is that the right data is popping up in the right time or better yet that you're just getting answers to your questions through some kind of reporting or kind of internal tool that, that can do that for you. So I think we're we're inching our way there, but to get there, we really wanna focus on those two use cases. Although there are other ones like safety and security, um, it's early days for the arm and what it means to have mobile manipulation on these sites. Uh, but yeah, I'm hyper-focused on the kind of sensing stuff that I described. And then adverse site conditions. Yeah, I mean, there's, no end to fun surprises on <laughs> job sites. Uh, we've come a long way with a lot of stuff. I mean, you can like turn the robot's perception off so it can plow through tall grass or snow, which like we've had to do on civil sites. Actually, the first robot I dropped off was like January 2020 to Palmerlow in Quebec on a job site. And there was like three feet of snow it had to like plow through to get from the job site trailer to the site itself. Mm. So we like turned obstacle avoidance and perception off so it could plow through and then it got in the building and all of its like cameras fogged up briefly and it couldn't see where it was and then it was fine. Um, we, we get like, you know, yeah, mud, puddles, things like that. You know, the robot's surprisingly capable of dealing with those things if you have some knowledge that you'll encounter those things because you yeah. can record tunable settings into the mission too. You can slow the robot down. You can speed the robot up. You can switch from walk mode where two feet are on the ground at any given point, which is the typical mode, to crawl mode where you always have three points of contact to be extra careful on loose or slippery surfaces. You can tune the friction settings. There's all sorts of stuff in the tablet and of course then in the SDK underneath that um, that allows you to kind of customize those missions. You just have to kind of have a sense of where you might encounter those things yeah. or be extra cautious in case you can. The robot can also wade through water technically up to its knees because there are no electrical parts up to that. I've seen it wade through like three or four inches. And if you do it slowly, you can get through it. It's actually more of a perception problem because the still water will act as a mirror. And then the robot thinks it's- Oh, like right. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think we're trying to make it easier and easier and we're trying to make it more automatic in terms of the robot kind of perceiving these things itself through its various sensors and adjusting accordingly. But right now that's where the skill of the operator comes in when you're recording those missions is to le leverage those like tunable settings. And then you can get through a surprising amount of difficult stuff um, if you've got those settings correct. I'm curious. Oh, sorry, can I ask one more question? Um, I want to give Noni a chance to get going. Okay. I'll okay. Talk okay. okay, we can come back tomorrow later. Okay. okay. I want to hear Noni too. Okay. Well, I think your questions will still be really relevant after the next two of us go. So we'll, we can pick back up on it. All right. Um, did you guys see my screen with the green lines and the robot? Yep. Okay, great. Um, my name is Noni Pittenger. I work at Assembly OSM. Um, Brian and I actually used to work together at WeWork in the construction technology team. Um, and we worked on some robotic pilots together. I learned a lot. Um, and really stemming from that uh, is kind of like an encyclopedic introduction to the state of the field uh, and the construction challenges that were, uh, or the construction conditions that were challenging our ability to leverage robotics more effectively. Um, it definitely, kind of define the course of what I was working on for the next couple of years and, and continue to. So um, my area of focus is, I mean, conceptually, it's digital to physical verification strategies and the configurations of construction technology that allow us to achieve that better. Um, whether that's higher resolution or um, a more well-defined data set, um, kind of been working with primarily um, laser scans, um, 
existing survey technology, existing aerospace metrology technology, um, and then really all of it kind of funnels down into layout activities. And um, you know, layout is where our model meets the ground for the first time and um, building up some more predictive uh, coordination in front of that phase is, is the area of focus that I've been working on in AEC. Um, yeah, and like I said, so a lot of this comes to some of the things that we want to achieve. Uh, the tools are not readily available in the AEC industry. So um, a lot of the work and kind of the rabbit hole I've gone down is um, examining existing manufacturing um, and aerospace uh, tolerance conformance tools um, and applying them to architecture. So I'm going to show you two case studies. Um, one is a static, um, static model calibrated projection project for complex geometry and fabrication, and that relates to construction robotics. And then the second one um, is more brief, and it's um, a way to approach um, a unified network of measurement tools in prefabricated architecture. So uh, before we work, I was working at CW Keller and Associates. If you are familiar, they are specialty fabricators of uh, mostly five axis millwork assemblies. So inter interior curvy panel uh, arrays and systems is what they specialize in and then can basically fabricate anything else. They have this amazing um, staff of really highly skilled craftsmen in their workshop, um, You know, steam bending wood, fabricating things to these really tight tolerances and trying to deal with just the material realities of uh, deflection and deformation. So we had a project, um, so it is a little bit out of order. All right, I'm just gonna skip back and forth, whatever. Um, so uh, the project that we were working on was at the Coca-Cola stage at the Alliance Theater in Atlanta. So the design is a um, hundred, say, uh, individual unique panels with um, steam bent oak stringers running along them. And these are parametrically designed. They're optimized for acoustic porosity. Um, and, and basically they, you know, the, the level of finish edge meeting was incredibly high. Um, so we're working with curves. We're working with uh, really complex buildups and we're working with steam bent wood. So we have a lot of things that can introduce error into the system. And I'll go back to this kind of, this was a diagram I developed while I was working on this project to kind of illustrate what we've all seen in different scenarios and everything that is gonna to relate to either prefab or to specialized construct or specialized fabrication is an analogy for any construction project you've run into. If you can, you know, if you can abstract it up into what are you drawing and modeling? How is being translated as it's handed off through the delivery process? And where are your opportunities to stop the lossy translations? Um, and maintain that fidelity across delivery without having to be completely vertically integrated and just own every step of it. So, you know, the typical project delivery in a fabrication project like this is that you have a design as agreed upon by all stakeholders. Um, it is rendered in 3D in a model environment. Uh, that model environment is used to generate documentation. And then that documentation is shared out as uh, while experiencing some changes out to people that are going to execute the work on the field. Um, and what we know is that the model is this incredible buildup of digital information. It basically holds and can receive everything that we would need to, you know, it, it could be the central, I mean, it should be the nucleus of the project. It should be the, the one true source of information. But uh, based on standards in the industry, you know, people need 2D documentation. So there's just, this is an existing challenge. And I think when we all look at these problems, we're, I think, you know, it's, it's best to think about ways we can reduce information loss. And it's also really more interesting to think about ways that we can short circuit entire linkages to just make sure that our information is translating across more phases. Um, so in order to accomplish the fabrication of these panels, I looked into, our team looked into uh, 3D projection. So this system is used most typically in carbon fiber layout uh, for wing manufacturing or complex form, I mean, typically in aerospace. It also is uh, kind of more simplistically used to just paint logos on the outside of uh, airplanes. And this, this particular type of projection is, at, is a dual galvanometer um, throwing two beams in space to, a, to make a point of light 
in 3D. So this is taking curves from your model and rapidly cycling through that curve geometry uh, point by point. There also are, um, there's a lot, even in the last like five years, there's been a lot of development in other calibrated projection technologies where, you know, predictively deforming the image that you're going to project from a, a, a simple projector onto the curved surface, uh, all model driven though. Um, and, and, you know, the main limitation of this is that in these, in its intended use case, it's in a, um, a, gant a, a calibrated gantry and tool situation where uh, you know exactly where this table is in relationship to the projector, you know exactly where this part is in relation to the, the table. And you can see that when whenever you see these little targets, these are retroreflectors that will um, allow the, the laser can measure off of them and calibrate, triangulate its position in space and, and then correct for the projection so that you get really high levels of accuracy as are required uh, to make spaceships. When we looked at them, well, the way that we were using this um, in our fabrication was that we had, it just, there were, there were so, let me, when you assemble something like this, so you have a computationally designed jig, which will receive all of these stringers, and then you get a back of the panel, and it, it's just incredibly complex. We had a really difficult time getting successful meeting of these stringers end to end, and also um, understanding if the, the structural connection embeds on the back of these panels were where they were supposed to be in 3D space. So really, what we were able to use this for is you can calibrate to a particular fabrication scenario, and then use it iteratively to verify edges or center lines of the pieces that we were putting in place. And this was really great. I mean, a lot of, this is taking away paper templating on Steamboat Wood, like there's the paper stretching, is deforming, like it's not giving you any more sense of accuracy. It could be uh, kind of like self-fulfilling bad templating, you know, showing you, confirming that you are deformed with your deformed template. Um, but really like the iterative QC that we were able to do with this, and the way that the craftsmen were able to understand the technology and start to trust it was amazing for the, the workshop culture there. And it also, um, it helped deliver the project. So- the, the uh, Sorry, the image you showed, that was in your shop, I assume, right? That, that's not mm -hmm. on site. No, so this is, um, this presentation actually doesn't have pictures of the job site, but. Um, that actually is a good point. So we, we use this to fabricate the components, and then we also used it to, um, once, the, once the components were fabricated and verified, we used scanning on the job site to calibrate the projector in different view cones to the job site. So we had, uh, you know, these are, those will have curved profiles if they were touching the ground and we located those curve profiles with the same degree of accuracy based on the same, we did the same type of coordination work, workflow where you define the environment that you're working in, you identify the points of um, coordination, which were you know, uh, unified checkerboard and retroreflective targets to center this, to be able to register the scan to your calibration coordinates. Um, and then we projected on the job site to show where these would go. So it was, it was very like end-to-end, -end, really exciting. Um, yeah. Cool. It really works. I, am I <laughs> correct, Noni, that in this case study, the designer designed the way they wanted it to look, and then somebody had to figure out how to build it? Yes. So Is I think that correct. Yes. Yes, definitely. I think that there was an artist that was involved in the kind of ideation, and the style comes from his work. Um, okay. And then I think, but I, I think that when it came to the scale of this. I know that the Keller engineering team did a ton. I mean, just the engineering lift and feasibility feasibility studies were a really long phase. And it was a lot of engineering hours to um, just you know, take a, a curvy formwork language and rationalize it into how many stringers and what type of right. rib, ribs do you need and all, a million other questions. So um, there, will, there will be projects like this use case where there's an artistic idea it's Absolutely. not connected to how you would build it. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, like means and methods. Yeah, it seems we have like a ideally, larger toolkit of means and methods than we yeah. than we think currently exist. And I think yeah. this is why the metrology is really exciting and kind of its host of possibilities. Super. I mean, it seems like ideally that the design would be based upon how you're going to build it. 
rather than having to figure out how you're going to build it after you come up with the idea. Yeah, but I don't then, know if you want that constraint like fund, in your fundamental architectural approach yeah. to you. Yeah. Depends on which designers you talk to. Yeah, yeah it depends on okay. what school you're from. Yeah. Um, like I went to Sire, so I say <laughs> my schooling was that you design the blob and then you figure it out later. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I worked, I worked at SOM. I was more constructivist, I guess I would say. Anyway, okay. I, I mostly I don't I don't even do architecture anymore. I only work with these tools. So I'm okay, out of um, the game. But so I don't know how much time I'm going to try to keep yeah. flowing through these if if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I want to give Gabrielle time. All right. Well, so basically, the, the remainder of this presentation has to do with you're you're doing anything in the physical world from a model, you need to define the relationship between what your assumptions are and what your realities are. And if you're using a machine to perform any of that work or to check any of that work, you need to have you know, that definition as the input for that machine to work functionally and to actually get value out of it. So it's the same type of thing if you're calibrating um, a projection system to a panel or if you are trying to get a, a robot to contacts, if you're doing layout robot or some kind of ro a robot that needs to have contact with the surface or any, any type of mechanization like that, you're, I mean, you're using the same type of positioning and localization framework thinking as you would, I mean, I, I think it's fairly fundamental across the board that if you think about it this way, it becomes an informational problem and it's not just a patch on top of something that we aren't really doing in construction. But if we think about it at a higher level, you can start to change the way that we approach construction. Um, these are just some of the tools that you can use to look, you know, give your robot or whatever your tool is an understanding of where it is in the world. Um, and so for this project, uh, we define a, did a proof of concept at the Autodesk Research Facility here in San Francisco that basically uh, calibrated the projector is static. I wanted it to be more agile. I wanted it to be able to respond to a larger view angle. And I also wanted it to be able to respond to um, the model like wanted to synchronize all of the model information with what, what the projector needed to show and use the robot to orient the projector to achieve that. So this is kind of our stack of tools that we were using um, and how we were going to approach the site. And this is basically what it looked like uh, is, so we have, we have our room, it's been scanned. Um, we're gonna project the edge connection points for these past system of panels and them out in the world. Uh, this is what it looked like actually in the facility. You can see the with the video frame rate, you can really see that kind of bouncing of the beams of light and the, the individual spots of light. And when you look at it with a little bit longer exposure, um, this is what you're seeing. So in this yeah. proof of concept, we, the geometry that we were working with was not panel and bed, but um, we scanned the exist. We had a we had a construction model, um, a design intent model of the space. We scanned the model to receive an as built update of what what our environment was, and then we reprojected the we updated the geometry to the as built conditions, and then we reprojected the edge geometry back out into the environment to understand if the that loop which, and, and all of the associated drift of the thing that the machines that we were using was good enough for construction. So you can see here it was lining up pretty pretty well and um, it was you know really exciting and a very creative process and tons of troubleshooting um, with the uh, projector. Um, and then so really quickly this the other case study is basically what I'm working on right now at assembly OSM is a completely different format of, of trying to construct something. But again, I think the same, the same approach can be adapted to this where we're a prefabricated residential architecture company. We are stacking things into a module and then stacking the modules into a building. And the, if you approach this in the same type of calibration mindset, you're gonna understand, you know, okay, what kind of, what kind of dimensional spending a lot of time on dimensional control. So tolerance studies of how accurate are our parts that are coming into it? What is the accuracy of our sub-assemblies? Um, 
when we're assembling, what kind of dimensional feedback are we getting from our production line? Um, what is the shape of the thing when it leaves the factory? What is the shape of the thing when it hits the site? Um, and then what is the shape of the building as we stack up? And so this is basically adapting a lot of existing site survey methods, enhancing them with um, way higher resolution uh, aerospace metrology tooling in concert with it, and then reconciling it with the model-based design environment to give us progress updates. And I think that's it. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's really great. I'm sorry. I, I realized you could have talked more about the oh, second that's okay. study. Okay. That's, oh, okay. No, well, that's, this one's just a quick, I can't talk too much about it, so this is good. Okay. All right. So, um, Gabriel. Are you there? Yes. Yes. Super. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight with you and to be among the presenter, among this wonderful panel presenter. Uh, what Brian is doing with the, with the Boston Dynamics Spa is opening up amazing, uh, amazing new horizon. And what Noni just introduced uh, blew my mind because I have, um, like them, an architectural background. Uh, I, I studied as an architectural engineering. And, and I'm seeing how these uh, new tools, parametric design and robots, are introducing a paradigm shift from uh, being able to, to design what is buildable to being able to build what is imaginable. So mm -hmm. I think this is, this is an important transition enabled by these technologies. Um, today, uh, as you say, David, uh, I'm serving as a director at Vection Technologies. Um, if, you, if you allow me, I would like to share my monitor um, to show you a couple of pictures. Uh, this is saying I'm currently sure. able to do that. Um. I don't know that I have control of that. Okay. Uh, you can't, you can't do it. I, yeah. I think I'm enabled now. Good. I think Carson might have control. Yes, let me, let me start the full screen mode. So um, yeah, I'm a director of uh, Vection Technologies and um, Vection, I'm personally responsible for developing um, new technologies, exploring new technologies and developing a business. Um, where I'm currently involved in developing business in different industries, including, of course, AEC, but also maritime, automotive, industrial, and education. And one thing we, um, uh, we're focusing and we help these uh, companies with is generally accelerating uh, their, their build process and removing walls that separate uh, various silo stage in the, in the software. And we're doing this with the real-time data. So we are providing a real-time data solution that includes, of course, data coming from the side and augmented and virtual reality technologies. And in particular, uh, we've been exploring a new intersection between uh, the BIM model, um, the digital twin uh, experience it in virtual reality and the actual build uh, on site. And um, we realized that um, what Boston Dynamic is, is developing, the, the robot, the spot that Boston Dynamic is developing could be a wonderful interface um, to connect this work together, to connect the digital twin to what is actually built and the BIM, BIM model to the, the actual building. Um, we're exploring in particular uh, two case studies. The first case studies involves the, the BIM modeling. So validate and compare BIM model with build. Uh, to do this, we're, we're, we're using the Mindesk platform that I personally contributed to, uh, to developing. 
And what Mindus does basically synchronize in real time a BIM model, like a Revit model, for example, to uh, virtual reality rooms where people can be immersed for design review or for uh, collaborative uh, design review. This is like a quick example of what the experience looks like in MindDesk. For example, these architects in San Francisco is exploring the, the BIM model of, of a new cultural center. She's double checking that the foyer uh, high matches the, the, the fire control code. So, in this context where a BIM model is, is being to be explored in virtual reality, uh, we can leverage data coming from a robot that goes on site and do a 3D point scan uh, of the build um, to then load this data in real time onto the BIM model and match and compare using uh, control points, like for example, QR codes. And here we can validate that the position of all the structural elements uh, are in place. And for example, we can uh, detect some mismatches. Um, this is as valid as for the structural elements, but you can think this in context of H HVAC. Another, um, another industry where this matchmaking is very relevant is the naval industry. So uh, in the naval industry, if you think of big ships, those are developed in chunks that then need to be um, built together and match it. So in these cases, having a, a double check between the build and the beam model becomes absolutely fundamental. The second case studies that we're exploring where um, a robot and built environment meet um, is uh, making inaccessible or dangerous spaces available. And if you think about it, um, a building site for, for its very nature is inaccessible and dangerous to the point where people need to be certified to get into them, to grant access into that. Um, this became more evident uh, when we were working with our clients and uh, they asked for a digital twin of their, for example, their real estate um, environment. This is just one, uh, one example of, of a work we developed with Hire, uh, where Hire asked us to create a digital twin of, a, of the prototype suite um, of their kitchen where they uh, show their, their product. Um, but the, the opportunity here is to um, start from the, the digital twin of, of a, a, a location, like for example, uh, think of a, a real estate or a digital shop and use the robot that is on the side to have a real time picture of that building site matched on the digital twin. Uh, this opens up to incredible possibilities to have a real time portal in, in the real life in the context of what the, that space will look like. Another example of this uh, applied technology is uh, aerospace. Uh, we've been seeing a, in a, we, we've been seeing a lot of advancement uh, recently with um, companies like SpaceX or NASA um, launching and, and scaling up uh, their rockets. Um, so if you imagine this in the context of education or the kind of messaging that these companies want to, uh, to establish, having an on-site portal that can be experienced by anybody, by anywhere in the world, in the virtual environment, uh, can really open up to unprecedented experiences. So 
So this is what we're we're exploring currently as Vection. Um, of course, if you have any question, this is my email address. I'm very glad to answer. I feel like I, feel like I know some contractors who awesome. could you use those tools to more accurately uh, to find discrepancies. You, so you, you, you mentioned using it to find, I guess, find the discrepancy in existing construction, but what about the potential for like, I, I guess Noni kind of talked about this, but using it to, to place something in the right place in the first originally, rather than finding a discrepancy afterwards. Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, really why, can't, why can't you use it as a model that you build to, rather than as a, a diagram that you use to check? Uh, I, think, I think those are both very valid use cases. Um, there, are, there are, it, it pretty relies on the kind of processes that different companies adopt. Right. Yeah, I guess maybe, maybe that's a little ways in the future too. If, if like a, you know, construction workers had to carry around like a, a bulky kind of VR headset and, and a battery or something to actually like locate things properly, maybe that we're a little ways away from that. Not, yeah. not too far away. Sorry, Dennis, yeah. was your original question, why can't we use like the digital twin to just locate things correctly in the first place? Yeah. It so. sounds that's kind of like that's kind of what you're doing with the lasers, but maybe. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the answer is that there's so much to account for that the like, I mean, you think of like the buildup of a sub assembly or something, you're, you're trying to predict what tolerances you will need to accommodate based on what kind of tolerance, like, is it heat based? Is it just a fabrication tolerance based on the materiality of it? So like, you think in terms of that's the type of problem solving you have to do for a small, like a bathroom pod or something. Um, when you think about a construction site, there are so, so like interface design. So if you're trying to say like the interface of the slab to this thing and to this column, you have to think back upstream to everything that would have impacted that. So I think I, I think a VR uh, assembly and construction uh, placement is not super far away. There's a lot of drift uh, work that needs to be tightened up because you know, if, you, if you do like a digital layout and then you try to look at it in VR, you, you're seeing a difference in the, you know, the spatial, it's just difficult to see it in the right place. You'd really tight uh, like the digital calibration into that. And that's still not trust, like you still couldn't do it for contract work. Um, I think that my answer to you is that so you can't have everything be perfect because it's just it's materials in the real world. So what you try to do is reduce the number of things that need to be perfect. So this is like reducing down your data set to whatever interfaces are critical, whether it's like connections or you know like structural connections or plumbing connections or something, any example, and you want to focus on those and you want to give enough space in between those things that you can reasonably achieve the critical point, but not introduce too much risk into the overall system by expanding like what can happen in between them. Is that? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. yeah I believe Noni, that's why you referred to the design intent during your presentation, is that it's almost like you're yeah. building to an intent and then afterwards you're documenting, okay, this is exactly what was built. Yeah, so that's Which the standard. Have, we should not be yeah. doing that. We should. We have the tools to, you know, we have the tools yeah. to bridge the gap closer than that. If we, you know, the traditional yeah. delivery method is that we design intent model, a lot of stuff happens and then you get to scan it at the end and you're like, oh boy. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of iterative BDC type working and, and like, you know, uh, survey work. You can have other automations on the job site that are just sort of checking. We, we can get those feedback loops. But you can also start to re reduce the number of feedback loops that you need if you can reduce the information that needs to be perfect. And sometimes you can do this with just like you have your slabs and columns and you're going to do storefront layout. Can you just float that in space a little bit more so that you're not always registering off of something hard that then would clash because of the, the errors in the column layout or something? You're asking the designers to have larger expansion joints to accommodate that? I don't, I don't think they'd like that. 
I, I'm asking them to prioritize what needs to be in the right spots. What, what kind of bothers me about these conversations is the assumption that the design model would encapsulate everything required for construction. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that happen on site, sometimes necessarily, um, that are knowledge gaps that are filled in by tradespeople who, mm -hmm. who know, you know what to do in that situation. And this is why you do the check, not just to make sure that it was done the exact way the architect was done. You do the check to establish a conversation between the field and the office so that you can actually collaborate with those tradespeople, use best practices, adjust as necessary, deal with physical reality. And I think there's, there's kind of this idea that like we could work better together with these technologies. It's not just, you know, policing or enforcing design intent into construct, although you know, some people, <laughs> you know, some architects, <laughs> some architects are real expensive and, you know, you're going to do the detail the way they design, but, you know, for the other 99% of the built environment, like, I, I think there's an opportunity to use this technology to create feedback loops for collaboration between designers and trades. And, and I love mm -hmm. that about the technology. Exactly. Yeah, and, 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 and that's, that, 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 that was exactly in, uh, included in, in my opening statements where, I see this robot as an interface between the build and the project where uh, the real time data flow can uh, can help putting that together and 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 have a more meaningful uh, collaboration uh, from between people that cannot like may not necessarily be in the same places and this is where also virtual reality uh, kind of help merging and bringing all together uh, and under, under one umbrella. Yeah, I think the latency reduction is really big there. And then that was like live, live or feedback from the field is the way to, have, to move forward in the project. Yeah, I need to jump in here for a second because we're just after six. I want to respect people's time. I want to really thank the three of you, Noni, Gabriel, and Brian for joining us today and providing so much really stimulating information for everybody else for joining in and for Carson at AIASF for um, organizing the logistics and the promo. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks um, for the invite and the conversation. We, yeah, we continue talking as long as people are comfortable, but I wanted to make sure that we thanked you before people left. I have to okay, go. So. Thank you guys okay. all so much. It's great. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, thank you, Nani. I do too. It's a little late here, but thanks everyone for making the time and, and for the awesome questions and conversation. Okay. Take care. If anybody wants to stay around and have to talk, I'm just going to be on air until everybody's done. Yeah. It's, after six. it's, it's after six, Dave. So now it's uh, it's cocktail hour. So we can. Uh, well, I don't know. We usually go on 10 or 15 minutes. It's up to people. So, yeah. um, Gabriel, you're gone. Oh, these co presenters. Okay. So, um, the next uh, event is going to be on the 20th. And the topic is going to be generative design. We're definitely going to have Autodesk. Um, I believe we're also going to have Saltmine. So, that's up to the negotiations of uh, Autodesk. We'll see how that comes together. And um, as always, it will be participatory. I really appreciate people jumping in with their questions and comments tonight. Um, does anybody have any last thing they want to um, chat about or contribute before we sign off? I, I just wanted to thank you for hosting, David. No, that's, this, this is, this is uh, amazing. So. OK. All right. Thanks yeah. for participating, Mark. All right, have a great night. Enjoy your happy hour. Okay, <laughs> bye. All right, take, take care, thanks.